Welcome to a special episode of The Partial Historians. Today, we sit down with the host of the amazing podcast, Myth Take, to discuss all aspects of Seneca the Younger's Medea. We hope that you enjoy. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. And good night. Welcome to another episode of Myth Take. A fresh take on ancient myth. Uh, we still got it, Darren. <laughs> uh, it's been a while. I forgot. It, it, was it has been, a, it, it has been um, a little while since we have done an episode, but I am really excited about tonight's episode. We have two special guests from halfway around the world joining us by the virtue of, or by the miracle of technology. Mm -hmm. We have Dr. Fiona Radford and Dr. Peter Greenfield from the Partial Historians podcast. They are experts in ancient Rome, which we are very much not experts. They look at various aspects of Roman life and reception in their own podcast, Partial Historians. So we're very pleased to have you. Hello. Hey, thank you so much for having us. <laughs> That was Dr. Rad. <laughs> yeah, I probably, I probably should distinguish my voice. We just set that up straight. Yeah. Any stupid things said by this yeah. voice are the property of Dr. Radford. <laughs> and I'm Dr. G. Thank you so much for having us. Well, we are very pleased to be connecting with you, and I'm glad that we could work out the, the time zone difference. We're recording from Canada, as usual, in Ontario, and you're all the way around in Australia. So I, we're very glad to be connecting with you. It's a, it's a Commonwealth podcast. Yes, yes. Truly international. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And I'm also excited to have you because we are going to talk about Medea, which everybody who listens to this probably knows by now is one of my favorite characters. But we're going to do it a little bit differently and have a look at Seneca's Medea. And Darren and I are not a strong... Well, Darren, Darren knows, knows this play better than I do. I have never formally taught or really study this play. So I'm kind of... The, <laughs> I'm the real student here, um, but we are really excited to have some Roman experts on board for this conversation. Excellent. Yeah. Let's get into it. Ooh, yeah. Yes. So I, yeah. I think we should start with a, just a consideration briefly of who is Medea. Let's locate Seneca within the context of the subject matter. <laughs> yeah, true. All right. Well, Medea goes back a very long ways. <laughs> Darren, do you want to give us a, a quick rundown on, on her mythology? Well, Medea... Yeah, like you said, she's one of their sort of older characters that, that, that you know, have been probably kicking around since the Archaic period, more than likely. We, we encounter her, at least on the Greek side of things, in Euripides' work about 431 BC. There were other playwrights like Nephron, for example, that wrote about Medea as a figure, um, this uh, woman from Colchis, from the Black Sea region, who is a foreigner, a barbarian, a mysterious sort of other type character with associations and magic. And then her relationship with Jason and the Argonauts, which is a very old myth, right, uh, is picked up and, you know, used time and time again. So we see Medea, you know, in different iterations and tragedy and lyric poetry uh, you know, here in our discussion with Seneca, all the way into the imperial Roman period, which I don't live in very much. But uh, so it's a, a long stretch of time to have, you know, one sort of character uh, called Medea and, you know, what she is. And I think everyone knows what she's probably most responsible for or her infamy or her fame. So, you know, she's a non-Greek character, but a very compelling and powerful female heroine uh, in a catalog of heroes that are primarily male. Yeah, the Romans seem to really be attracted to the story of Medea. I mean, obviously, when I say attracted, I don't necessarily mean in a hugely positive way, because um, yeah. as you say, she is quite infamous. But yeah, they, they definitely mm. seem to enjoy going back and back to the story of Medea. And I think there's something very compelling about Medea's story as well, because bound up with it is the whole spectrum of human feeling from everything from intense attraction and affection and love to like the bitterest of human sorrow possible. And she captures this within the arc of her life. Mm. And so there are so many elements of her story I think that people can hook into and repurpose and 
when we talk about attraction, I think it's that compulsion. It's almost like things become so devastating in her life and in her mythic tales that it's hard to look away. Yeah. And there's, there are some key events that all of the different authors who we have, and presumably uh, from what I've read, there were a lot more plays and and, uh, tales about Medea in the ancient world than survive that then have come down to us but Mm -hmm. the the broad outline of course is that jason shows up with his argonauts and he needs to get the golden fleece medea betrays her father and helps him out and in their flight from colchis back to greece with jason she marries him and kills her brother and then we are of course um, located in Corinth, where um, Jason is now marrying the princess. But depending which author you have, there's different nuances and different interpretations and different details for each of those. So it's a really flexible story that gets retold in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think we see this coming through with Seneca's Medea. It's a very formal kind of play, um, very Roman, I would say, in its structure, if we're Inevitably, people will make comparisons with Seneca's work with the very famous Euripides play, Mm. and they're very different in structure. Even though some of the messaging is similar, um, they get to the conclusion in very different ways. And one of the things that I think that tells us about Medea is just how she can be reinterpreted consistently over time for different audiences while keeping some core features of the story but while also shifting a lot of the contextual details around how that story unfolds. Like, I, I like that because like, like, like any good myth, it's too, it sort of adapts, it's dynamic, and it sort of serves, its shape sort of fills the vessel. And by that, I mean it serves the audience at the time, or at least the narrator's agenda, wh- whatever that might be. So I, I think the Medea characters are really plastic in that way. Yeah, so I think it's probably a good place to think about just the basic plot of Seneca's play. And uh, we sort of, we start off with um, a a conversation happening outside between Medea. She's alone on stage, actually, I should say. It's not a conversation just yet, but she's sort of like locating herself through this kind of soliloquy. Um, she likes to have conversations with herself. She does like to have conversations yeah. with herself. It's a very, <laughs> it's a very ancient play thing to do. Um, popular all the way through for centuries, really. <laughs> um, discussing sort of so positioning the audience to understand her story in a particular way and help everybody come to grips with where we're at, where we're up to in her life. And she's in Corinth, and this is a very typical place for plays about Medea to start as well. Mm -hmm. But from there, we sort of get into a whole sequence of events and Seneca seems to like a sort of a really particular structure to his plays. And some editors of the Latin collections do like to divide it up like that as well. So it feels like that we have distinct scenes, even though Mm -hmm. we're not really sure what any of the stage directions might have been. And so one of the really um, important character devices in Seneca's Medea is the role of the chorus Mm. and the way that they tend to set up how you might interpret a particular set of action and they also tend to be a marker point for a change of scene as well either towards the end or towards the beginning so the chorus has a lot to do with this and we see this sort of like ebb and flow between Medea expressing herself having a conversation with Creon Mm. uh, the king of Corinth about needing time before her exile takes place, having a conversation with Jason where he's kind of like, you got to get out of here. And she's like, I need more time to get organized. Where am I going to go? How am I going to live my life? And he's like, it's really important that you leave. And she's like, you know, you dumped me, right? I I don't know that I should necessarily be bearing the brunt of your poor decision-making because the reason why she's been asked to leave is she's now the third wheel essentially in her own life. Um, yeah, Jason no longer needs her. I mean, he's, he's got a new wife, a new shiny wife. Jason's about to marry a new woman. He hasn't really told Medea about that. She's found out because she's about to be exiled. They're <laughs> like, you need to leave. And she's like, excuse me. If only all breakups could work this way. <laughs> <laughs> Medea is really front and center in this play too. Not only does she start off with the with the opening, but I have 
cannot put my finger on the exact statistic at the moment, but she has the the vast majority of speaking lines in in this play. So it's very much her driving the story. Oh, massively. It's definitely the Medea show. <laughs> she, <laughs> and she and Seneca definitely puts her more forward than Euripides did, even though obviously she's a huge part of Euripides as well. But we do get some sense from the sort of secondary characters that there are some concerns about how she's coping with the situation that she finds herself in. Rightly so, as it turns out. So there's some good foreshadowing presented through the character of the nurse Mm. um, and discussions that happen that relate to the tutor of the children. They've got some concerns about what's happening. And fair enough, um, she's not taking things well. And she makes that abundantly clear through her spoken time on stage as well. But she does manage to negotiate with Creon to have a day to get herself organised. and. She makes it pretty clear early on that she's going to use this for vengeance. This is a pretty standard moment for Medea in terms of her representation in literature. Mm. Uh, First of all, buying the time and then being like, all right, now for the plan. And she does the grand reveal of, well, the plan is this. It's going to be bad and I'm looking forward to it. You know, I'm going to find a way to poison that new wife. And then I'm going to take things to the next level because you know who's really responsible here? Jason. Jason is the real issue. Uh, I can't disagree with her in some ways. (laughs) And in that sense, it's a very modern kind of uh, representation as well. She refuses to take a sort of a victim blaming position. I mean, she does take vengeance against the second wife, but that is all part of her plan to take down Jason. Mm. It inevitably, it goes well in the sense that it, it all happens yeah her plan works um the plan works (laughs) that might be the worst part of all perhaps and bonus points she takes out creon when she takes out the new wife oh yes they go down together in france yeah yeah Uh. Yeah. (laughs) father steps in to try to save the daughter it doesn't go well yeah this is all described vividly by uh people who come into the play to like deliver messages and we end up at this final set piece which is Um, the moment where she executes the children that she and Jason have produced together, one of them directly in front of Jason. Which again is in contrast to what happens in Euripides' play, as far as we can tell, where the murder of the children would happen off stage. Yeah, so there there is a transition of the violence to the stage. Mm. Yeah, and Jason's Jason's a very different character as well in Seneca's. I I know we're trying not to compare, but it's really really <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's very <laughs> difficult not to. But he's be, be, his circumstance is different. He's not marrying the princess so much out of love or desire to step up in the world, but he can only get safety for them if from Creon if he is marrying Creon's daughter. So there's there's a different there's a different motivation behind the marriage, correct? Yeah, there's something like that going on, self-preservation. The the the, the mood is very different, right? The function that five act f- framework is very different from an attic drama. Like Medea's in your face like right at the very beginning and she doesn't leave your face till, you know, she's stepping in the chariot. So like you, you know, you get a little Jason and you get a little Creon and you get some chorus thrown in, but you know, she's right in your eyes for the whole play. And it's not like Euripides where, you know, some there's some circular motion, like the characters are coming and going slightly, and there's negotiation with chorus. But but here in Seneca's, it's Medea from from beginning to end, and, and, and it's extremely compelling. But like you said, there's a very different type of Jason that's being presented here. A lot of people like to throw a lot of dirt on Jason and Euripides. I'm not a big fan of that. But here in Seneca, he's a pretty sympathetic character, at least from my reading of it, you know, <laughs> he's, he can't do much of anything, but, <laughs> but suffer, <laughs> right. But, uh, you know, that in, in the face of such overwhelming hatred and violence, what can, what can one man do, you know, even if he is the hero of, of the Argo, right. Um, who Medea lays out quite plainly in Seneca that not only does Jason uh, owe his success as a hero, but so does every single Argonaut uh, on that expedition also, uh, you know, owe their success to her, you know, that that's pretty hard to overlook. And so many of them have come to unfortunate ends. (laughs) And they have And Medea in the Seneca play too, there's something strange and about it in the sense that 
you can get overwhelmed with lots of the magic and the details and the artifacts and so on and the, the terrible ferocity of that character. That sort of uh, when I use the word terrible, I don't mean in a in a moralistic way. I mean awe-inspiring power. And um, she has a number of moments of that are transformative within the play itself. Euripides Medea is much more of a slow reveal. I think that Seneca's is has those, but there's blinding flashes where she's n- no longer herself uh, in in the play and becomes something much more terrible. I use that word again. So, yeah, I just like I, I like the contrasting element of it, and I, and I really did enjoy revi- revisiting Seneca's Medea again. Well, his his Medea is much more emotional and passionate right from the beginning. I, I I would say, and 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 I wonder, does this have to do with Seneca's own uh, philosophical leanings? Yeah, I think I think this is probably a good time to talk a little bit about who Seneca actually was and maybe give him a bit of uh, historical context because uh, that could possibly help us to decode his interpretation of Medea a little bit. So as as I think you guys mentioned earlier, Seneca is my, writing much later than Euripides. He was born, as far as we can tell, towards the end part of Augustus's life and therefore he got to see... A uh, little bit of Augustus, but he was probably obviously, obviously a child then. Uh, he certainly would have experienced the reign so of Tiberius, Caligula, and then most famously Claudius and Nero. Now, it's probably worth mentioning that there has been a bit of dispute about whether Seneca actually authored a lot of these plays that are ascribed to him, but we, we won't worry going into that. Let's mm-hmm. not create too much trouble yeah. for ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not going to go into that. Um, but presuming that he did write this particular play that we're looking at, uh, it's very possibly something that he wrote whilst he was in exile during the first half of the Emperor Claudius's reign. He had gotten himself into a little bit of trouble. He did. He? Yes, it, adultery, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He fell afoul of both Caligula and Claudius uh, for, for diff- very different reasons, <laughs> um, As at least that's what the sources um, tell us. There is something... I think to be said for the fact that he might be exploring certain themes relating to his own experiences under the Julio Claudians, which we can come back to in a sec. But he's also most famous, obviously, and this is probably what you were getting at, Alison, for his uh, for his Stoic philosophy. Is that what you were referring to in terms mm-hmm. of his mm-hmm. own beliefs? Yeah, and, and so like that Stoicism that that is coming that sort of underpins a lot of his writing. I think we can see the effects of this in terms of the way that he structures his plays and also the kinds of messages he might be trying to have the audience take away. One of the key ideas that really drives the Stoic framework is like how you think about the way that you feel really shapes everything about your world. And that becomes like a a piece of advice as a stepping stone for like, well, how can I think about the world and my feelings in a way that might be reasonable and useful to me? And what we see in Medea is a character um, and indeed a whole cast of characters very much bound up in their emotions and trying to figure out how to respond to them. And while Medea is obviously the central figure in all of this, she is by no means the only character who is trying to figure out how to respond to their feelings about the world. Mm. Um, She eventually places Jason in that position and he also details moments of his own struggle with reaching the decision to take another woman as a wife. And we also see Creon and his concerns about, you know, wanting to have a stable situation, Mm. which is only possible if Medea is no longer there uh, physically in the city. How interesting that she was being exiled while Seneca was himself in, in exile. exile. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Could there be a parallel? Yeah. <laughs> and, and Seneca had an interesting life in the course of his kind of rise to prominence and exile and, and, and return because he, he was originally from Spain, was he not? And he spent time in Egypt as well. So presumably he would have been exposed to various versions of this story from various sources from different places. Yeah. So he, I mean, he ends up in Rome as a child um, and is educated there, but he, as you say, he is born in Hispania and So there is a sense in which this is a period in Roman history where there's a lot of um, shifting from the periphery into the centre. And 
we get a sense that one of the ways that you could read this play is also through that idea of the outsider versus the insider. And Seneca, for all of his education, to what extent does he consider himself absolutely a Roman um, is a good question to ask. And he becomes very involved in the imperial family and the legacy. And this might play into things as well. So like being close to power, how you self-identify could produce interesting resonances for how he thinks about Medea um, and to what extent he might empathize with her situation on a certain level. Well, especially dealing with Creon as well. I, I believe there, there might be some messages there as well about how a ruler conducts themselves, which as I said, probably might have, might have had something to do with his personal situation because he does seem to fall afoul of Caligula, perhaps because he's a little too good with the words. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then, of course, he seems to be caught up in some sort of sexual scandal or at least suspected sexual scandal with Claudius's nieces and Caligula's sisters. We uh, always at least have one to be of careful of those sort of assertions. I, I know, in I, Rome, know though, I know, don't we? Yeah. Uh, yeah, political invective often takes the form of this kind of uh, sexual innuendo yeah. and sort of salacious accusations. So it's hard to know. I think it's fair to say, though, based on his other writings, because he, he did obviously take a lot of this time, eight years, to to write, he definitely wasn't happy about being exiled. <laughs> and, no. and funnily enough, you know, he, he might have been channeling a bit of Ovid, who also wrote extensively about Medea <laughs> and, and was exiled. And if there's anything that we know about Seneca, it's that he is a very literary man. Definitely. And he structures a lot of his writings, stoic and otherwise, it seems, around a conscious engagement with literary tradition. Mm. So I think it's a real shame, actually, that we don't have Ovid's Medea mm. as a point of comparison. Uh, Ovid is a very engaging and nuanced writer, and to be able to compare those two plays uh, from a Roman perspective would be amazing, I think. For all of the things that are very interesting about Seneca's play, if you asked me uh, if I wanted to go to the theatre to watch Seneca's production of Medea, I would probably say no. For what reason? I don't find her a psychologically compelling version of Medea in this play. And it's weird because it's not like the plot is necessarily that different, different. Yeah. in all of its yeah. sort of overarching points from, say, Euripides. But reading mm -hmm. Euripides together with Seneca, I would go and see Euripides' Medea in an instant. It feels yeah. like there is a real psychological insight and development of character of Medea on stage in Euripides. And I feel like what we get in Seneca, for me as a, as a modern person in the 21st century, it doesn't feel psychologically compelling. It feels very yeah. literary and it feels very imperial Roman and I can appreciate right. it on those levels, but, but it doesn't feel yeah powerful in Th that way that does raise the question as well about how much Seneca actually ever envisioned this play being performed per se as a play and how much was it meant to be recited or read if you know what I mean I was just about to ask <laughs> I was just about to ask you about that and uh, you beat me to it yeah so Weird. it seems that it was a bit of a trend as well that at some point literary men would dabble in writing writing a tragedy but it wasn't necessarily intended for performance and sometimes intended for reading which is would be a slightly different approach yeah and I think we can see that almost instantly in the depth of like intertextual and mythological referencing that's going on in Seneca's piece mm -hmm. like it's yeah, it's not an easy read I went into this preparation thinking, oh, you know, I'll sit down with Euripides, I'll sit down with Seneca. And then I was like, oh, no, oh, no. I got to Seneca and I was like, I need a critical edition of this work. <laughs> and I'm like, there is, it is very dense in the sort of information that it's offering line by line in some cases um, in whole speeches where you're like, okay, if I can't piece together this whole mythological web that is being offered to me, I'm going to have a very difficult time understanding the nuance of what Seneca is trying to get at here. And that makes it a play that is not for people who are just going to the theater for a good time no, <laughs> um, no. or people who are not really quite across all of this mythological 
depth that Seneca is bringing to the table here. Yeah, yeah, he show, he's he, it's it's like he's showing off a little bit um, about his own uh, depth and breadth of knowledge of the myth. And y- you mentioned um, Ovid earlier, and we unfortunately don't have his Medea. That's what <laughs> that's one of those uh, plays that you know if you could save one thing from the ancient world, right? But he does deal with the myth as well in uh, in the Metamorphosis and in Heroides as well. Um, and I know Darren's pretty familiar with those sources. Well, I, yeah, a little bit. Yeah. I, re- I, re- I reread Heroides 12. You know, we're not talking about it exclusively today, but like in that in that sort of area, you know, in that area, as far as a Roman author is concerned, dealing with this topic, it's it's not a play, obviously. It's their, their letters, you know, the, between Jason and Medea. In this case, it's Medea writing to Jason. That's a ver- very different one and very different to, to, to speak about because it's it, there's not a lot of... Um, agreement on whether or not it's a, of, of even a, a tragic tone. Um, some people think that it's that it's a more uh, satirical or comic, but uh, you know, there's, there's a definitely no love loss between the two. That's for sure. In the, in that letter. Yeah, this is true. And, and I think the thing to me that's really interesting about the way that Ovid is navigating Medea in that letter is that it does feel like, she's attempting to come to grips with everything about her life in a Mm -hmm. way that that does encompass some of the anger but letter writing itself allows for moments of reflection which Mm -hmm. when we think about what happens with a play a play is more like well we've got to jump from the thought to the action quite quickly um having people write letters for instance or have a journal (laughs) doesn't really work (laughs) so much on stage and so the letter is able to accomplish something that I'd be interested to. Yeah. Now I need off. It's Medea, the play. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe somebody will be unwrapping a mummy somewhere and they will find, <laughs> find it. You know, what struck me as I, I, the sequence that we read them sometimes affects your perception of them. So I had read Herodes 12 uh, in preparation and then a couple of days pass, and then I read um, over the course of two nights Seneca's play, and um, that one-two punch there was very striking in the sense that one I have Euripides, of course, in, in my mind, but uh, when I read um, Herodes twelve, when I read Ovid, um, Medea in that one is leaving the door open very often for a return to um, this um, sort of idealized husband and wife situation. Does she? wants Jason to come back to, to her on a number of occasions. And I was kind of struck by that. And then when I went into Seneca, you know, you don't really get it. There's like a line, there's like one line after, you know, Creon comes and Medea talks to him uh, and Jason comes back and she says something like, Castus is coming. One king is against us. There is another come with me. And, and, you know, the two of us together will, will, will flee right and i went whoa really even after all that magic and hatred and passion and and uh uh, and everything else uh she still she still says to jason like one line let's let's leave together jason says uh no (laughs) obviously but uh her her response to him there i thought was like wild because everything else is all snakes and fire and then in one line she's like you might want to come and it'll it'll preserve you, right? Now preserve you. And I think that's the thing about Medea that that makes her such a compelling character, yeah. to be honest, because that what she has always longed for is to be with Jason. And that has shaped the way that she behaves in response to everybody around her. And so there's yeah. this sort of compulsive codependency for her Mm. which she she finds it impossible to break and despite her anger and her frustration and the remorse that seems to be quite genuine at times that she feels for the acts that she has committed in pursuit of this relationship um, she still ultimately it doesn't mean anything for her if he doesn't stay and in a way that that gives us, I mean, that's part of the tragedy of it, but it also gives us a really keen insight into, into her state of mind. Um, she has to double down 
And when she can't, and that that's taken away from her as well, it sort of pushes her beyond the sort of thresholds of morality as we tend to see them. But that's why I agree. Yeah. I actually do agree with you, Dr. G. I have, I, when I read, I read both Euripides Medea and I read Seneca's Medea in preparation for this episode. And I have to agree with you that even though there are some interesting elements to Seneca, I, I agree with you that I don't find Medea as psychologically compelling because she just comes out all guns blazing from the get go. Uh, she is she is so strong and she is less sympathetic. I think uh, for for me, looking back, I, I know Euripides is very complicated in the way that he handles her status, both as you know, as a potential barbarian, as as this person who's not exactly like what you you know, like a mortal woman or anything. Like, there's obviously a lot of complexity there, which I just think is lacking in Seneca to a certain extent. And because I think we I feel don't like get that character build. No, and 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 you don't get that arc of her actions. You know, of of what what mm-hmm. path is she actually going to take? But I see much more coming through Seneca's Medea, him dealing with that classic Stoic idea of the need to moderate emotion, to to learn how to deal with an, an emotion as powerful as anger and the disaster that can result if people don't learn to to handle that in a in a productive way or or a way of, of handling your emotions in a sense of what point is there in getting so worked up over situations that you yourself have you no know, control over? You you cannot control what you know what the king is doing. You you can't control what Jason is doing here. Why are you getting yourself so worked up about this? Look at what happens when you allow emotions like love and rage to run rampant. Yeah, and I think he's definitely showing us the danger of passionate love. That it's a very it's it and this violent anger are two sides of the same coin and that in some ways her anger shows how deeply she loves. As you say, she's, she's unable to um, step back from that and to, to detach herself that she's, she, um, when one source I read described it as she's opened a hole in, in, in the wall of herself and that both lets Jason in, but it also means that, it makes her weaker for that. And that, so she turns to these, to this passionate anger when that love doesn't work out how she wants it to. Well, you know, there's something about that Medea and Seneca that I think we're either overlooking or attributing to something else. And, you know, I think simply it might be, you know, it's uniquely Roman in the sense that, especially a connected Roman like Seneca, who's used to being in the presence of powerful figures, like an emperor, like Nero, you know, like you got to know how to walk around these guys. You got to know how to talk. You got to know how to keep them, you know, at bay. But because they, they, they're they extremely powerful, like with a whim, like Medea, they could destroy you. And we've seen, we've seen what's happened. They're, they're hair triggers. They're like the opposite at times of what it means to be stoic. So like if a character like Medea in this play is someone who's like bottled lightning, you know, they're a lot like a Roman imperial figure themselves. And the character of Jason and, and Creon and all the rest of them are just the people that are in the orbit of someone with incredible imperial power. You know, you, they, Medea goes for a transformation at the beginning. She asks herself, who am I? And then about, I don't know, like act four, I guess she says, I am Medea. And that means something completely different. When we look at that concept, there's that heroic concept or theological concept called uh, artukeia, right? And it means like a complete sort of release of freedom, a shedding of the bonds where you become something that is, you know, that requires no support. You know, like, like what does an emperor need? Nothing, because they have everything, Right. So that's a transformative moment. That's something that struck me when when I read Seneca, along with all the witchcraft and the crazy stuff that was in there too. But <laughs> I think this is a, a fantastic sort of perspective to to adopt this idea of Medea as like the imperial figure, 
And how, Sorry, in- how intriguing that she that Seneca might have used a track like Medea to try and teach Nero to, you know, rein it in, rein <laughs> it buddy, in. Buddy. Yeah. <laughs> but also as a warning to like, because this allows you then to read Jason as the guy that bumbles through the imperial court and is the Senecan <laughs> yeah. figure who gets himself exiled. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's like, it's, yeah. Like, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but doesn't Ovid sort of do the same sort of thing when like in his metamorphosis as an overarching theme, is it not really sort of like a, a treatment in some ways about be careful who you upset because, you know, <laughs> They transform you like the gods themselves, right? These encounters with these powerful beings, sometimes they're good, sometimes they're bad, but they're always meta- They're always changing. They're always about metamorphosis, right? Like mm-hmm. that could also apply if we use that as a, as a model for Seneca in some regards, as a someone of that era, maybe. Definitely. And Medea herself is, is going through her own transformation all the time Mm. um and this is something that Seneca has definitely um leveraged from Euripides and surely it's been popular from Euripides onwards this idea that Medea is not simply a mortal woman that that she that the divine streak in her is significant and it will have really particular effects and it means that she goes beyond um in many respects what anybody thinks that she could be capable of. I think that's one thing that did strike me more front and centre in Seneca is that emphasis on on the witchcraft and the connections to like Hecate and that kind of thing. Uh, whilst Euripides doesn't obviously neglect to mention those aspects to Medea, I feel like she comes across as much more of a quote-unquote normal woman in the situation that she's in. Up until the point. Up until the, the point end. where she flies away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's it's interesting. There's there's almost um, a continuum from uh, Euripides' Medea through to Apollonius Rhodius's Argonautica, and then to this play. Like building on that on that witchcraft um, in Apollonius, he pulls out a lot more of that magic aspect of her. Now, granted, it's not this episode that he's dealing with, but with the, with the other episodes he deals with, he he pulls out that magic but it's almost an innocent mass like almost as though she's a young girl who doesn't quite know what she's doing whereas here in Seneca's Medea we have a mature Medea who knows exactly what she's exactly what she's doing and and the magic and the the way it's described feels much more nefarious to Mm -hmm. me than 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 it did in the Argonautica I think it's so interesting that that Seneca is uh, emphasizing that angle. I mean, it'd be completely anachronistic, obviously, to say anything about Agrippina the Younger here, because, of course, it's before she potentially (laughs) murders Claudius uh, using those sorts of elements. But certainly what Seneca might have witnessed in Imperial Rome, I mean, this is the age of Lacusta the Poisoner. You know, it's not like these methods of particularly women eliminating Mm -hmm. people uh, wouldn't be unknown to him I would say yeah there are definitely rumors about this kind of thing and there Mm. are definitely you there are street corners where you can find these people selling their uh, skill set as it were but I do like this consideration of the fact that Medea in Seneca's play and also in Euripides because we're seeing her at that edge in both of these plays is that she is in the mature phase of her life, you know, she has become a mother herself. She's married, you know, she's lived a a good deal of her adult life. Whereas the thing that is the landmark for her in terms of how her life unfolds is potentially a mistake of a young woman, Mm. um, potentially on the cusp of adulthood, taking a risk for a boy that she liked and, it being the mistake that sets off in consequence the rest of her life in a tragic fashion and because the mistakes start to build. Um, oh, de- look, I, I mean, it's, it's, I'm being completely anachronistic, but I can't help but look at it through the eyes of, a, you know, a modern person. And it, it does, it does sound like that old story of that girl that got mixed up with that guy, started doing things that she didn't really want to, you know, didn't, 
not no, maybe not didn't want to do, but started doing things that she might not have done if not for him. And and Medea does seem to she does dwell on those things that she did. Obviously, as you said earlier, uh, she does keep thinking about. But I did these things for you. I did these things for us. And 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 now where are we? Yeah. So she gets trapped in like a, a sort of a young woman psychology mm. where she hasn't come into her full sense of herself, and she does make a choice which initially I mean doesn't seem so bad you know she's helping a boy out that the monsters are involved and it's like you know there's no there's no big risks there I mean the monsters are risky but like in terms of like the moral yeah. question yes you're like you can overlook that be like well you know somebody had to deal with the What's dragon the golden fleece between friends, you know yeah. <laughs> um, but that sort of slides into like oh, okay well how are we going to get out of here we now need to leave yeah and that leads to a really pivotal moment which um, totally haunts her definitely yeah, yeah. and yeah. she she does seem to be haunted by the treatment of her, her past. past and how she yeah. has navigated that and that's the thing that really cements that situation between Jason and Madeira I think far more so than the acquisition of the fleece itself mm. and and it's interesting that her her story with Jason begins with subduing the monster the monster serpent guarding the uh, and and then she becomes a monster herself in the way that Seneca presents it is she is monstrous and she goes off. She, she calls on serpents again. And this, this serpent angle, I think is really interesting, but she calls on serpents again and the winged chariot and all of that. And she becomes something monstrous herself. Yeah. There's this lovely motif of serpents that is running through Seneca's Medea um, which is obviously mm -hmm. supposed to remind the audience of that initial moment um, between her and Jason and, and what she has done there. And then we start to see that sort of visualization of Medea in the serpent chariot, um, which is coming through in vaseware from like, even like, so sort of like at the same time as we're getting Euripides play in Greece, we're seeing, uh, red figure wear from southern Italy which has the same kind of imagery on it um, so it's just astounding the way that that serpent motif continues to develop and evolve yeah it was all sorts of monsters and scaled horrors and and different types of poisons and different sort of iterations of the power of fire that struck me as interesting you know about how you know venom and fire and poison and flame were all sort of part of the same sort of kind of complex of like magic that was able to destroy Medea's enemies, whether it be a building or a person or whatever it was, she, you know, she had it all down. Like the, the way that the magic worked, like you were drawing lines between what she said and almost every hero <laughs> that you could come across. She had an artifact that linked it to Heracles it, all, all sorts of uh, different monsters, the chimera, everything was all in there. The Charybdis and Scylla, you know, they all had, she all had a, a fang or a scale or the ash or, or something that was just filled with this, this powerful force that, that only she could channel and use to destroy her enemies. And I thought it was just like overwhelming in its detail. Yeah. Seneca is amazing for the detail. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he uses those serpents as a as a motif or a representation of sexual passion in particular, but also calling on these um, ancient connotations going right back to Typhaeon and Python and the Hydra, like those ancient um, stories of, of serpents. You know, the other thing too was, I don't know how much the Romans were into ghosts, but I read a lot about go more about ghosts in, in the Roman context than I did in the Greek context. So my 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 instinct is that they were you know they're fascinated by them. The Greeks probably were too. But in in uh, the idea here, I don't know. Like you said, like if you're reading it or watching it performed, but the that scene where Medea is confronting or confronted by a ghost that she doesn't recognize. And then she said, then she sees that it's absurdus her brother. And then the play mm -hmm. just sort of just goes into like overdrive at that particular moment where she realizes now what she has to do. I, I kept thinking about Shakespeare's Hamlet, but 
that's at the beginning and not like three quarters of the way through, you know, like it, but still I've never had like Euripides doesn't have ghosts in it for crying out loud. Like, but this one does, right. Everything else is there. So why not throw a ghost in too? Right. And the Furies are there as well. (laughs) And the Romans have a lot of interesting ghosts. Um, This is true. They, they spend a lot of time thinking about the dead and what is happening at that intersection uh, where you can get in contact with Hecate. And there are festivals set up specifically to deal with placating the dead spirits at times of the year where the barriers between the planes of the world are, are quite thin. And so for Medea to see a ghost Mm. Um, would not be out of keeping at all from a Roman perspective. And the Romans are just so obsessed with their ancestors as well. You know, they they yeah. they have obviously they keep those funeral masks and they they come mm-hmm. out you know for certain occasions. Like they they, they are so connected to the people. They're always having for. to walk past the imagos of the of yeah. The past so Medea being <laughs> yeah Medea being fixated on her brother in particular is it does know, make sense it does from make a sense. Roman perspective yeah. for sure. Does does that make her her crime? of killing Jason's father that much worse to a Roman? Not necessarily because Medea is not herself from the region. So in the sense that like it would be a problem for Jason, definitely, but Jason finds ways to not be the one who's actually absolutely involved. Mm. Um, So the stain is really on Jason rather than her. Certainly she carries a lot of blood guilt related to her own family which would be looked upon terribly and yeah. i mean she's not going to come out of it well from a roman perspective anyway no um all the all the murder still not good. Uh, all the murder <laughs> but also <laughs> even if we're reading it through um that roman reading it through a greek lens then she's sort of behaved in ways that don't represent piety um in any way And she's being driven by ambition. Mm. And all of this is rendered more monstrous from a Roman perspective because she is a woman. Yeah. And I mean, look, to be honest, I'm totally speaking off the top of my head here. I haven't, I hadn't really thought about this until it came up in conversation, but of course, by this stage in Rome as well, uh, women had, most women would have had those kinds of marriages where they, they still had very strong connections to their family of birth than their husband's family. Whilst of course they become more and more tied to their husband's family, you know, when they have children and that kind of Mm -hmm. thing. And they obviously want their children to succeed and that's their main goal in life, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, they do maintain extremely strong ties to their family of birth um, and their own part of familias. So I think, I think Medea having that, that strong loyalty to her own family would, would make sense in, in the Roman context more than what happened with Jason's family. Yeah, like always a daughter and always a sister, like having a brother, right? Like that's a pretty important relationship in a Roman woman's life is the relationship that she has with her, of course, her father, but also with her brothers, right? Yes. Even in, even during marriage, right? They're like, I've heard it said that they're always a daughter. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's true. And, I, and he would have actually, he would have, he would have heard about that firsthand, of course, because in spite of the fact that, you know, for hazy reasons but maybe something as serious as trying to overthrow him he saw Caligula who he knew exile his two sisters and and then constantly threatened to kill them and then in spite of all of that he would have heard about them or seen them coming back to Rome and one of the first things they did was make sure that Caligula's body uh, or remains I should say was properly buried um, and had and had the honors due to it so you know they, they were sisters you know, to, to the, the end, end yeah. yeah. And and I think that that difference is something worth teasing out a little bit because uh, for the Romans, again, like Medea and Jason's marriage is going to stand out because of the passion element, whereas in ancient marriage generally, and maybe I'm overgeneralizing here, the marriage is not love match necessarily, right? No, no, that's right. Yeah, and this is one of the fundamental problems, I think, for Medea and Jason is that everything about the way their relationship begins means that from a moralistic perspective for the Greeks and the Romans, this can't succeed. If this relationship was a success, it would break the moral fabric that has been Mm. set up 
in terms of how marriage should operate, who should control it. Yeah. And all of those patriarchal structures are undermined. Mm. As the uh, meme goes, I, I saw a meme circulating on, on, on Twitter about marriage is, is, is an agreement between two men for a Roman woman, but she's not necessarily involved. It's her father and her groom possibly, and certainly the groom's father as well, who are making that agreement. And here you have a couple who made the decision for themselves in, in this passion. Oh yeah. And, and with the of choosing Jason as well, it seems like she really makes that choice. She's the driver yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. And then further complicating it too is that the women, like we, we have a, a tendency in our modern society uh, or our Western um, society at any rate to think of, of children as belonging to their mothers, sometimes even more so than to the fathers. But legally for the Romans, children belonged to the father. So they're not even really her children. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And Jason kind of makes that clear as well, mm. that, you know, these these are children that are going to, ideally, it would be better if the children stayed with him because then he can yeah. incorporate them into the new family. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that definitely seems to be something that Medea is striking against, I, I think really in Euripides as well, but, but certainly in Seneca about she's striking at the house of Jason. You know, she's, she's striking at, I don't, I don't know how you that wanted. legacy yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. patriarchal yeah. structure itself which is which flows from father to son yeah it's, it's not about you you never even though jason is a very different character as you highlighted in euripides to seneca there's never i think a scene where you see really strong emotional connections between jason and his children that's that's not really a focus it does seem to be much more about that that legacy aspect yeah it's definitely not given a lot of time to discuss how that works no. You know, considering the case of the play, it's a, it's a few lines here or there, and then you know you're you're into the terrible stuff. You know, it's been said too in the Greek context that a marriage is, of course, a marriage ritual. That it's just as much a community affair as it is between two individuals, and that a successful marriage, at least from the religious side of things, as far as Greek religion is concerned, if it goes off without a hitch, then everything's okay because the bride and the bridegroom have transitioned from what they were into what they will become. And that's good for them, but it's also good for the community. So if we consider this in a, from a point of view of Medea and Jason, here's a, here's a marriage, you know, that um, was begun outside uh, of the Greek world. And in, in uh, that is, you know, steeped in, uh, <laughs> I don't know what blood murder, right. Uh, in uh, less than convenient circumstances, that it's never really allowed to uh, to transition in, into uh, the Greek world, and it, it's it's out of context and out out of sync with with just about everything uh, that that we would come to understand about what we might call a proper Greek marriage. So not only do they, not only do they suffer, but the whole community suffers as a result of the of being in close proximity to these. Uh, characters that are much in flux, specifically Medea in particular. Yeah, and I think even if you look at it in uh, in the Roman context that Seneca is uh, is dealing with, now that you've got this imperial system, I mean, the imperial system is, is very much set up like it's it's almost like a larger version of that familial unit structure, mm-hmm. you know, the, the way that people like Augustus get the title, you know, father of the country, and that becomes a very sought after way of looking at him. And he's all, he's almost like this giant part of familias for the empire. Yeah. Uh, and the family is such a key unit, even before the empire, the, the family is always such a key building block in the Roman state and the way yeah. that their society has to function. And, and it's very much that idea of when a woman is acting out, if she doesn't have a, a strong man to control, her, if, if she doesn't have a strong man to control, her, if she doesn't have a strong part of familias, chaos will ensue. We, you know, women can't be entrusted to have that kind of independence. Um, and as you say, it is it is bad for society if you don't have the structures in place like you're supposed to. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that is similar to to looking at Euripides version in, in the Greek model is that this is this is what can happen if if a woman doesn't have her curios, if she doesn't have somebody overseeing her, a male somebody overseeing her. Yeah. And I think as for Medea and the way that she operates in society, it is um, perhaps convenient in terms of the theatre, but also fascinating in terms of the psychology that she is still able to 
find allegiances with other men mm. in times of trouble. And she escapes. And she does. Yeah. yeah. Gets out of there. She gets away. Um, yeah. But being able to wrangle her way to securing some alliances and some promises of aid um, from other powerful men, um, despite the fact that she clearly, in some senses, is being set up as a symbolic no-go zone, like this is how you don't do womanhood, <laughs> uh, is itself really interesting because within the terms of the play itself, she's she's always pushing back against it and sometimes it's working out. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting that the King of Athens doesn't put in an appearance in Seneca's version. What 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 do you make of that difference? In a way, it's kind of like skipping to the chase, isn't it? Because I mean, she go because we've started at that really like that fever pitch of mm. anger, which is a quality that the Romans tend to deplore anyway, and she's running with that throughout most of this play. Like it's almost like her transformation is pushed forward mm. um, as a result. It's like the anger is building and building and building, and all of a sudden, it's not a surprise that she's there in a chariot. Yeah, it's like it's kind of like it's reached such a point that she doesn't need that external point of safety anymore. Mm. Um, she's discovered it within herself, and that was probably going to happen in Euripides anyway. Mm-hmm. And and, un- and we see that unfold in a slightly different way. But, yeah, she's kind of self-contained. Um, it does seem like more of a play element to have Medea in Euripides, you know, going, oh, but but how will I get out of this? Like, what's my escape plan? To have to have the character dealing with those sorts of um, issues does seem like more what you'd expect in something that's going to be performed, I suppose, as the audience is like, ooh, what's she going to do? Yeah. How, you know, what, how's the plan going to unfold? It, it adds <laughs> to the tension, I suppose. Yeah, whereas by the time we get to Seneca, maybe the audience doesn't need that. And they're like, you know what? Let's just go for bit gold. Let's go for the big stuff. <laughs> Well, and it leaves her at the end of of Seneca's play with nowhere to go. She can't go back anywhere that she's been or to any family that she's had. And Mm. she doesn't really have a place to go forward to either. She just kind of goes into the heavens. Yeah, just into the the heavens. And then Jason says there are no gods. Yeah, so there's not even really a place there. And then you're at your knees. But but yeah, but I don't know. I I thought that part was quite compelling, actually. (laughs) Right. It's not just a change of address card. Yeah, I'm. I'm not saying it's not. It's. It, it's not compelling, but it. It. It leaves her in a different. I don't know. It's just. It. It. It has a very different feeling okay. um, compared to like when we finish with Euripides, Medea. We know that yes, yeah, she's taking off in anger, but this is the next step in her plan. We see her taking off in anger, and that's it. <laughs> there, yeah. You know, there's. There's not. There, there's not a hint or a clue or any idea of where she belongs. Like she may have found herself, but has she found where she belongs? Yeah, she is. Whole, she is her own place. And I think in a way that makes sense for Seneca, if we're thinking about like the stoic sort of positioning as well, is that for Jason to be like, there are no gods, I think that's him trying to just deal with the trauma that he's just uh, just taken on in witnessing Mm. the murder of one of his children because she's clearly leaving um and she's clearly in a chariot um and there are clearly serpents involved so yeah. good luck to her buddy i mean she's she's off and away but for this whole thing to be a, just a crescendo level of anger mm. i think that speaks a lot to what seneca is driving at definitely um what does it mean to hold that kind of rage and yeah. how can it ever be dissipated? And it seems like the answer that Seneca comes to is that that it can't. That level of rage belongs beyond the well, human and, experience. And what kind of life are you are you leading? You know, like where where is you know where is it leading you? Even though Medea is much more set on revenge throughout Seneca, she still does have those moments where she's kind of like, wow, am I really doing this? Am I really going to murder my own children? She still has those, those moments. Yeah, where she has to fuck herself up, being like, I can do this. Yeah. She does have a couple of both. Yeah, vacillates between the decision-making process or not. And that's something that they share, that, that Seneca and Euripides share, at least in that moment of psychology and Medea. 
it's not very long. But one of the things that that I that I was I found missing, and now correct me if I'm wrong, but what I found missing about Seneca, of course, it's very relentless. We've talked about that. But the idea is that there's almost no sort of rhetorical repartee. And by that, I mean, Medea doesn't use her gift of rhetoric to convince or manipulate like she does in mm-hmm. Euripides, right? Nor does there seem to be any sympathy with, which Euripides often does in other plays, but even in, in the Medea, Euripides Medea, any, any sympathetic portrayal of anyone on the outside whether it be other women or slaves or children themselves or, you know, um, marginalized characters, right? Nor is there any sort of, you know, you portray the gods as less than powerful, right? Or question their power, right? Mm -hmm. And their effect. So Seneca doesn't get anywhere near those particular things because rhetoric is not what it was or in, you know, fifth century Athens, right? There's something else that's important to him, I imagine, here. Medea's not to trying to change anybody's mind that I can see, right? Mm, I think I, I think I would accept that up to a point. I think it, it's probably dangerous to say that the Romans aren't interested in rhetoric. It's just that their style yeah, of rhetoric is, I is very yeah. different. And yeah. the way that Seneca is showcasing Medea through long set speeches um, without giving other characters a real entry point is in a way very much in keeping with trying to focus in on a particular feeling and rhetoric for the Romans as well. And and to a certain extent, it's for the Greek centers around speechifying rather than conversation. So you might look at, I spent a lot of time at the moment reading Dionysius of Halicarnassus. (laughs) Um, So (laughs) bear with me, but he is always, even at that point writing in Greek, always trying to put together set speeches Mm. um, for rhetorical effect. And so they're persuasive, not just in terms of their length, um, but for the arguments contained within that length. And this might be an argument for saying that Seneca isn't writing so much a play as he's writing some sort of document for circulation. Mm. Um, he's, He's not trying to build that conversational oratory into it at all Medea mm-hmm. does convince Creon which is a necessary element for the forwarding of the plot so that does happen early on in yeah. Seneca but it's mm-hmm. not the style I think I think there's something to be said about those, the differences in the way that Greeks in Euripides time are pursuing rhetoric and the way that Romans in the first century of the empire are pursuing rhetoric yeah but I, I agree with you Darren about the, the yeah. lacking of Medea's persuasiveness it's almost like in Euripides, her persuasiveness is one of her uh, fearful powers because she, mm-hmm. yeah, she is able to snake her way through situations. And and again, I think it does add to the dramatic element of of the play in Euripides, the way that the way that she works her magic. Yeah, her her danger there is not just her magic, and maybe not even primarily her magic, but mm. her ability to use her words and to use what is a manly skill in rhetoric. Um, Whereas in Seneca's Medea, her magic is her most, well, her her magic and her anger coupled together are the most fearsome um, aspect rather than her words. There's, there's not the egg on the, the contest of words that we see in, in, in a Greek play. Which is interesting as well, because incantation in conjunction with Pharmaca is usually very important. So it is striking mm-hmm. that it's not yeah. there. They, they even reference that in the play. She talks about the power of her word, right? But it's used in reference to the incantation process, the magic itself. Mm-hmm. I remember that. I, I made a little note, but I can't remember where <laughs> it is. But I was like, wow, again, there's the power of words, right? But then it was just about magic talk, right? Like speech. Mm-hmm. Mm, So I guess we could say that Seneca is then making a real differentiation between speech uh, and the potential of rhetoric and incantation as just very different modes of speaking. So were there any other angles that we wanted to explore? Yeah, no, I I feel like I've I've said, (laughs) 
<laughs> I feel like we've kind of come to a natural point, a natural conclusion. All right. So thank you very much for joining us. This has been a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much. Thank it's you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you for listening to this special episode of The Partial Historians, co-hosted with Myth Take. And until next time, we are yours in ancient Rome.